something really good, a hot topic in the news this week. has been charged with crime. This is a show where I try to educate Thank you for watching Truth and Justice with Vivian King. This is a show where I try to educate you about the criminal justice system through people's stories. I was just saying offline that I started this show in 2011 because so many people call me, they still call me today, saying, why did my son get this much time? Can you do something about it after he's been in prison for 10 years or 15 years? Can I get a time cut? You know, all these things that they should have been asking their lawyers. Or even though I've gone back to the district attorney's office to try to help so there's a voice inside the system to try to make sure that the system is fair for everybody, that there are programs and diversion programs for nonviolent offenders. When I was first a prosecutor in 1992, you could do 25 years for a crack rob. Now <laughs> people get probation or, you know, or, or diversion programs or things like that. People that have been inside the system like me have helped reform the system in ways that we can. But there are things when you get into violent crime that there are victims in that crime and then you have to deal with their, there's a victim's bill of rights. And so you have to deal with the rights of victims. So I, my, my purpose here is to allow you to talk about the things that you want to know about the criminal justice system through people's stories. We also have a call in. So if you want to call in and ask questions tonight, the phone number is 713-807-1794. And hopefully we'll flash it up a few times tonight. But tonight our guest is Mr. Raymond Curry. He's agreed to tell us about his story tonight. And I have my faithful co-host, Mr. Danny Sneed. So, Danny, thank you for making time to come today. I know you've been working with those veterans today, but you made time to come uh, talk with, uh, fit in, get in where you can fit in tonight. So, but anyway, it's Ramon Curry's night tonight. So, Ramon, tell us about you. Tell us how you started off. Uh, tell us about your life, and thank you for having the courage to, uh, to spend time with us tonight. Um, <clears throat> okay, I, I mean, uh, thank y'all for having me. I really appreciate the uh, invite. So, I mean, I could start. I, I like to tell my story in a couple of different phases, okay. right? So I, I like to tell my story before drugs and after drugs. Okay, all right. So, man, my mother, um, by the time she was 17, she had two sons. Okay. My brother and I. Okay. Okay, I got an older brother that's two years older than me. And um, so, you know, 17 years old, she got two kids. My sister is eight years old younger than I am. So for that eight year period of time, it was just my brother and I and my mother. And she was a, a, a really great young mother. Oh, She sweet. really was, you know, young, it's the early 80s. I'm doing born the best in 76, yeah. yeah. You know, she working, she doing her thing. She's, she, and then um, I was nine, my brother was 11. So this gotta be around 85, um, my brother, set itself on fire. At 11? At 11 years old. Playing bad. Playing, okay. Yeah, because my brother and I, man, my mother was a, is a, was, a, was a very phenomenal person, in my opinion. I remember I asked her for some money one time, and she was like, man, I'm not going to make a po hustle at you. She said, don't ask me for my money. She bought me a lawnmower. <laughs> she bought me a lawnmower. Um, for those native Houstonians, I used to sell the Houston Post. I used okay. to sell the Houston Post, the Houston Chronicle. I cut grass. So during this time period, my brother in the backyard playing with some stuff he shouldn't have been messing with, and he spilled some. We used to rebuild our own lawnmowers and stuff like that. And he had spilled some gas on himself, and then he set himself on fire. Um, Were you there with him? Yeah, I was there. I was there. My mother. Did he kill himself? No, my mother was in the front room, her and a friend, they were sitting in the front room. You know, this early 80s, they got the front door open, the back door open, they just chilling. I was in the kitchen washing dishes and when my brother set himself on fire, he took off running. 
So she saw him as he ran around the house. Mm. My mother, she ran through the house and she tackled him in the backyard. And my mother, she wore these long flowy skirts and she was bohemian if anything. And so she put him out. They rushed him to the hospital and um, my brother stayed, he had third degree burns on 50% of his body. Mm. And he, he stayed in the hospital for about 45 days, maybe two months. It seemed like forever for me. But that becomes a pivotal moment because later on in life, my sister, my mother passed away in 2008, but my sister, I How old was she? 49. My sister had a conversation with my mother and my mother started smoking crack the night that my brother got burned. Really? Yes. So they life flighted him to Herman Hospital. And the way my sister told me about the story was she said that mom was just crying. You know, her 11 year old, her firstborn is in the hospital, right? I see you, yada, yada, yada. And a cousin, you know, and when this was, and I get into that, her cousin, her first cousin, one of her best friends, I used to call her my aunt. She's passed away as well but her name was Vanessa. Vanessa told her, here, this will calm you down. Wow. And unbeknownst to me at that time, because I didn't know that was going on, that was what was happening, but my life changed. My life changed. So we went from, at that point, you know, the age, man, we had everything pretty much, goat cars, you know, all the little things. My mother, she, she a young woman. You know, she ain't using no drugs, none of that stuff. You know, she smoke a little weed. She works, she take care of her kids and stuff. And then the drugs just changed everything. Um, the next four, five years just changed. We went from having our own. I had never lived in an apartment complex. <laughs> I had, you know, I lived in a, we had a three bedroom house, big backyard, all that stuff. And so, man, at the, at, after the drugs came, man, it, it, we ended up in the projects. It was times when we were homeless. It was times we didn't have lights, water, or gas. You know, um, the relationship, her marriage to my stepfather was very, very violent. Um, very, very violent. Um, so, you know, it, I, I see the difference. I see, and I and I tell my sisters, I say, man, y'all didn't get to see mama. The we we had two different mothers. Wow. We had two different mothers. My mother used to cook every day. Wow. I came home from school. We didn't even eat out. She cooked breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. And her sisters are listening, and they know Darlene cooked every day. So I tell my sisters, I say, man, y'all y'all got robbed because you didn't get the mother that I had. So, you know, that was that was that man. It was um it was it was tough dealing with that. Um what was your brother's condition when he got out with 50% of the burns, I know and being So, in, he's a he my brother Is, is a, he still with us? Yeah, he's still with us. Can he with walk? Us. He can man, they told my brother that he would never walk right that he would have to have surgeries once a year because the scar tissues was not going to grow. They told him that, you know, they told my mother that he would, that he would basically be handicapped. Um, I remember when he came home, you know, he's two years older than me. He didn't like the crutches. He didn't want the wheelchair. So I used to have to carry him on my back whenever we went anywhere. I'd get on my back. He's the, he's the big brother, but I'm the, he's the older brother, but I'm the big brother because I'm bigger than he is. I see. So that first year, he, I mean, we, we, we just, he and I together, just doing things as kids, you know, he was back, he was doing everything. And that first year he had to go back in for the surgery. And when he came home, he couldn't walk again. And we, it was like the process had started all over. Mm. And he told my mom, I ain't never going back. I ain't never going back to that hospital. I don't care what they say. At the time, he 12 years old, I'm 10. And just to move things forward, he played varsity basketball, varsity track, varsity football in high school. Um, one of the fastest dudes, you know. Um, but 
and and he, he he's another tragedy uh, uh, because my brother was very athletic and into all of that, but then he ended up going to prison, and he's still there now. My brother been locked up over thirty years. Oh my God! You know, so um, yeah, my brother been locked up since Thanksgiving Day of '92. Mm. So you know, and didn't kill anybody. <laughs> so it's just um, you know, and we could. I guess we'll end up touching on all of those different things as well. But just that part. So that was that was my early childhood, and then the drugs came, and with that the conditions changed, right? So there was a, um, I started selling drugs when I was 13. I started hustling when I was 13 because I really wasn't a drug dealer. I was more of a robber or a jacker than a drug dealer. At and 13? At 13, yeah. I learned what? how to drive in a stolen car. So what, 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 what took you there? Well, so, thirteen's kind of young. Yeah, who was your mentor? Yeah, I mean, where did okay. that come from? Okay, so, <laughs> so man, look, at Jack 13, somebody at thirteen. At I mean, thirteen, damn. my brother's fifteen. I'm thirteen. So he was doing it too. Yeah, we we was we was you know my y'all was partners in crime. We, we partners in crime. My brother's thirteen. I'm fifteen. Now, what most of the burns not on his face was no, his that, body. Yeah, his it was, legs. It was from, his legs. It, it was okay. from his legs. Yeah, because that's what when he was did working. Did it stunt the growth of his legs? Did it make? Is that probably, why you bigger? Because he probably ain't. But like, my brother like five. He say he five seven, but I swear he five six. Okay. Yeah, he a little fella, but uh, he uh, at thirteen. I'm thirteen. He fifteen. Um, we got a couple of partners. He got some partners that's a couple of years older than him. I'm the youngest in the crew, for sure. And um, I remember at the time, there was a chop shop here in Houston. And so they was giving us $1,500 for IROCs, trophy trucks. You know What's what I mean? What's the IROC? I don't know. Uh, IROC Z Camaro. with the Camaro. IROC Z with the T-tops. Oh. Yeah, the IROC Z28. Z28. Yeah, they so, were very man, popular. Yeah, they, they. I mean, they give Especially us the T-tops. Yeah, $1,500 just for a the car. A car. And at 13, 15 years old. It's a lot of money. And, and all we had to do was pull up. Just pull a car in there, they pay you money and you walk out. So, man, we would go on heist and we might jack for five or six cars a night and take them over there, turn them in and get the money. Wow, so were y'all doing this with guns or knives or? Guns, sticks, knives, yeah, sometimes knives. you, I mean, you know, a lot of times people. And your, did your mother know you were doing this? She she knew I was in the streets now to the extent of, of what, what she knew you doing, were doing. What I was doing now, but you know, at, at our age, we coming up with. Now could anybody money. have told you something to stop or this is just what you were gonna no. do? Every and I tell now that I talk with kids, I tell and, and parents, I said, let me tell y'all something. My mother, my grandmothers, my aunts, my uncles, they prayed, they burned sage, <laughs> they talked <laughs> wow. to everybody that they could possibly talk to. To I had coaches and counselors and everybody. And you said your brother was an excellent athlete. athlete. So I mean, the coaches couldn't inspire him to because they. No one is really addressing the problem. What's that? The problem is we have teenagers or we have kids that's dealing with adult situations. Mm -hmm. So you telling me, oh, Ramon, stay, do your grades, do this, do that. The lights off at home, ain't no food. Right. Mama getting jumped on, this happening, that's happening. Now when y'all mama getting jumped on, she got two boys, y'all weren't trying to oh, fight the dude? Shit. Yeah. Okay, I was just yeah. wondering. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, yeah. It, it was, it was a, when I tell you, it was a very, very violent home. Violent home. I was raising one too, so yes. I understand. It was a very violent home. Um, I ended up shooting my, uh, I just for the lack of, for the sake of argument, he would have been my uncle because my mother's husband, it was his brother. We had a shootout with his family. Me and my, my brother and I had a shootout with him, his brother, and his uncle. So they having a shootout. Was one of with them the teenagers. ones going with your mama? Yeah. Okay, so y'all yeah. have a shootout. He had jumped on my mother. This was in 1991, before I went to state school, before I went to TYC. This was in 1991. My brother and I, we had been out, you know, robbing, doing what we do. And we came back to the neighborhood. Now, unbeknownst to us, um, Squilla and my mother had had a fight, and he had put my mother in the hospital. Mm. So, but like we hadn't been home, so we didn't know this happened. 
And of course, this before cell phones and all of that, so no one had called us and told us what's going on. So when we pull up in the neighborhood, um, my reputation, our reputation precedes us, and he started shooting at us. Who did? The, the, yeah, your my mama's stepdad. stepdad. Right. Because he was under the impression that we knew. Either he was under the impression that we knew, or he was just trying to get the drop. Long story short, of course, like I said, we had just come back from doing what we do, so we had a bunch of guns in the car. So the shoot I started right there on Fidelity Road um, in the east side of Houston. So, man, it was a big shootout, big shootout between us and them. And um, I ended up shooting his brother. Um, but it was a, yeah, so we de definitely defended my mother okay. all the way out, you know. Did but, the guy die? No, that sucker didn't die. Did the police come? Or yeah, I went to state school. I okay, went to, so I they knew you did. Okay. Yeah, I, went, I ended up going to TYC. So, um, you know, it was just, it, it is what it is. So that's. So the, how old were you then when you went to TYC? I was 15 when I went to TYC. I went to TYC in uh, December of 91. Kid prison. Yes. West Texas State T School. TYC, that acronym stands for Texas Youth, Youth Commission. Commission. Right. I went to Texas Youth Commission December of 91. And How long did you stay? I came home August the 26th of 92. And from the stories I heard, because I, I never went to TYC, but when I got to prison in 91, a lot of the guys that were young had already been to TYC. And the stories they told about TYC made prison seem tame. <laughs> Now, prison is violent, of, yeah, yeah. Prison but is TYC violent. was more violent because they're younger and they, 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 they fight. Right. They fight. Am we, I right? We were younger and we were scared. Scared of what? Everything. Okay. Saddle. <laughs> we, we was, and I can tell people, no, that's why we fought the way we fought. Because, man, I'm scared of you, you and you scared of me. Of me. So, so the minute faith. you do any barking, we're going to do some squabbling. That's how you deal with the fear. That's how you deal with it, because I'm not going to let you hurt me, do anything to me. And so, you know, and it was crazy. I tell some of them young guys that I talk to now. And how old are you now? I'm 48. Oh, shit, you old. You look young. I didn't know you were yeah. that old. Not 48 is old. Well, compared, oh, we're talking about shit when we were taking Yeah, 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 yeah. Compared to 13 and 15. And 14, and yeah, it's been, we're it's at been 15 a long time. right now, so I'm trying to, right now. we're, we're yeah, at least 15 on this side. Uh, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get it together. Hold on, we, uh, I'm getting a notice that we got a call. You calling us already? Call on, caller. What you got to say? Hello, hello. Can you, can, can y'all hear me? Yes. Great, great story. I wanted to ask, um, I, I hear the story coming from the, from the, um, the guest. Has there been any reconciliation with everything oh, going on in your youth? Don't put them on bad. I am. Has there been any reconciliation with everything that's going on in, in uh, that, that went on in the youth with any of the family members or any of the people that were involved in some of the um, acts of, in, in crimes um, in the past? So uh, I hang up and listen. Thank you. Thank you, darling. Um, no. So <laughs> he said the answer is no. The no. easy answer is the no reconciliation. Answer, the, the easy answer is that, that, that there was no reconciliation, right? Um, well, not with any of my victims, but with my siblings, there had to be some healing and some bonding. And, you know, so that was, that's, that's a whole different thing. But, yeah, it's been, it's been a process with us. With us. And okay. it's still going. Yeah, it's still going. It's ongoing. It's, 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 it's on, ongoing. Yeah. We have, now, did you have children before you went to TYC? Thank God, no. Okay, no. Okay, so you didn't have any when you went to TYC. Nor did I have any when I went to prison. My daughter is 11. She'll be 12 in September next month, next week on the 5th. Okay, okay. She'll be okay. 12. So you only have one child? I have one okay. one biological child, yes. Only one biological Okay. All right, cool. So we he's 15 right now. He's about 15 going to TYC. Now, when you go to TYC at 15, where's your brother? My brother is in the Harris County, um, what they called it back Jail. then? Yeah, the ha but they had the rehab, the, the, the Harris County boot camp over oh, there yeah, yeah, Tascacita. Tascacita. Yeah. yeah, that was boot, uh, they might have called it YSL, let me see, they called it uh, 
Texas Youth Commission. No, that's no, no. where you were. Uh, no, they just called it boot camp. Yeah, the Harris County Boot Camp. It was at Atascocita. It was at Atascocita. So that's where my brother was. And what was he there for? Robbery. Okay, and but you said you went for shooting. Right. But I went for shooting and robbery. Shooting and robbery. Okay, right. so they caught y'all with a robbery, too. Yeah, they caught Tell me. Tell us about that robbery. Oh, man. So what had happened was I had a couple of different... I, when I went to TYC, I went to TYC for aggravate, three aggravated robberies, aggravated kidnapping, <laughs> aggravated assault, and unauthorized use. Yeah, so Ag aggravated uh, assault was, a, was the, the mama's shooting. boyfriend's yeah. brother. Okay. <laughs> three ag yeah, three aggravated robberies, aggravated kidnapping, aggravated assault, and an and a unauthorized use of a motor vehicle. So, and your brother had some of those same cases. He yeah, was a my brother, my brother was a co-defendant, but he was seventeen already. Yeah, he was out. Yeah, so he went to to the adult prison. Adult, adult prison. Jail. Okay. So, can we say his name? His well, name? yeah, his name is Wayman. They, everybody know him by Shakur at this point. In time. So that's why they got the uh, the motivation to make the movie Menace to Society. Man, it's funny that you say that because I, um, my, my, my wife now, my fiance, she's young, and I tell her, I say, man, this movie was our life in the 90s. And people really don't realize. I say, this was what, this what we was into. The, our, re our reality. This was our reality, 40 ounces. I say, man, I don't even know how we made it out the 90s when we was drinking 40 ounces of beer like water. We was turning up 40 ounces. In the heat. In the heat. 40 ounces, Thunderbird. We drank old English like it was water or Kool-Aid. It's amazing that we was at that age. I started the day with a 40 ounce and a blunt. Wow. So obviously Breakfast. You, so obviously yes. you quit, so obviously you quit school. Well, so I, when I was in state school, when I was in TYC, and I was never short on, on brains. Okay. Okay? So I turned, I went to TYC and I turned 16 in 92, May of 92, I turned 16. You had to be 16 to sit for the GED. So as soon as I turned 16, I turned 16 May 31st. As soon as I turned 16, I signed up to sit for the GED. So I got my GED in the summer of 92. So at 16. At 16. So when I came home, my parent, my grandmother, my mother, they didn't even know that I had my GED. So I tried to go back to school. I mean, did they give you a copy of it? Can you? Yeah, yeah, you I had, had it. Yeah, I had it. Okay, I had it. Had it. Okay. So I tried to go. When I came home, I came home August the 26th of 92. It was a Wednesday. School had just started. So, of course, I'm 16. All the girls at school. I'm going to go to school. Everybody at school. Everybody at school. But you don't need to go because you already have a GED. But I didn't tell my parents. I didn't tell nobody. So I signed in. I went back to Galena Park High School. But it was too late. I was already of a different mindset. I wasn't a child anymore. Right. So when they trying to tell me to do something, You're not trying to I ain't trying to hear none of that. Mm -mm. So one day they was like, man, you got Saturday detention. I said, man, I'm not coming up here on no Saturday. So... I didn't go, of course, and um, I told my grandmother, I said, I'm not going back to school. I called her baby. I said, baby, I ain't going back to school. She said, what? What you, what you mean you're not going back to school? I went in my room, went through my stuff. I gave her the GED. I said, I wanted to give you a diploma, Grandma, but here. She said, it's good enough for me, and that was that. I ain't go back to school. Mm. So, Did she tell you to go get a job? Yes, I had to go get a job. My auntie was working at Doctors Hospital East Loop off of I-10. She said, well, you ain't got to go to school, but you got to get to work. So my Aunt Jackie got me a job working at the hospital, just um, like housekeeping, right, right, right. orderly and stuff like that. So I was working at the hospital, and um, I was supposed to be going to Houston Community College because that was the other part of the plan. I was 16. I was going to go do... Houston Community College, do my basics. You know what I'm saying? By the time my classmates graduated, I was supposed to already have my associates right. and be working towards my bachelor's. Right. That was the my plan. plan. <laughs> I see. That was my plan. Right. I was like, okay. That's a good plan if you can This is to my it. plan. I'm a, I got the job. I signed in to HCC. And what happened? They didn't care if you went to school or not. 
Right, right. Not if you don't go to school, you don't go to school. Right. So I'm getting off work. I got a little money in my pocket. I got a vehicle. I'm doing it. It's like, man, that, my, I remember a friend of mine named Sean Webb. I was dressed um, for work. I was dressed for work, and Sean pulled up, and he said, man, you want to smoke? And I said, yeah, yeah. So I fired up a blunt. I ain't make it to work. And I ain't go back to school. <laughs> so it was that, that was some, some good weed. It, it was, was. It was that, that was some good weed. That was some good weed. That was, that was back was... in the day we used to get it off of lifting weight. Yeah, that was some good. That was some good. Oh my god. Hey man, I said, he who? was. He wasn't here then. He was in Texas, Canada, then in prison. So he uh, wasn't no, here. What I'm just saying. He was 28. It yeah. was so good. It just made you quit your job. And no, no, no. I, you didn't go back. I mean, I, I got it. And so my aunt worked at the hospital. Oh, so she knew you didn't go back to work. So you already, this my mother's, she my mother's little sister, but that's still my auntie. Right. And she didn't got me this job. So really and truly, I didn't miss work. And now. Messed up her reputation. I don't want to face her. Right, right. You see what I'm saying? So that was, that was really the main thing. I was like, damn, I'm going to fix this. You know what I'm saying? And so I was like, well, I'm just going to act like I'm sick. And then, you know, it ain't no cell phone, so she can't call me and see what I'm doing. Um, I just act like I was sick for like two or three days. And then she just, one day she was like, so what, you just not going back to work? She said, them people gonna fire you. And at that point in time, I had already got back in the streets. I had hit me a couple of licks, had some money in my pocket. I was like, man, the hell with that job. They ain't paying me nothing anyway. And where was your mother at this time? My mother was, she was home, but she was in the, in, she was dealing with her addiction. But was she living with her mother? No, your she had a, it, no, she wasn't living with her But grandmother. you were living with your grandmother. Yeah, I was And that's her mother. That's her mother, yes. Okay. So my mom, I'm from Fidelity, or Clinton Park. My mother lived on Fidelity, off of Fidelity. My grandmother lived in Galena Manor, which is right there with it. So, and her sisters and stuff. So right at that point in time, she's very unstable pretty much pillar to post, okay. so this is going on and this and that. So you go to the stable house yeah, with your grandmother. Yeah, I went to my grandmother's house, and then I really didn't want to go to my grandmother's house, but her husband and I, that was a volatile situation because I had stole my grandmother's gun. I stole my grand. I went to my grandmother's house, and I took her gun. I was going to kill him. You going to kill? Oh, you going to kill your mama's boyfriend. Yeah. And my grandmother... Even though you'd already been at TYC, you didn't care about going back? No. Or for your mama, I guess. Yeah. I, I was like, I'm a, I'm a minor. Mm -hmm. I'm a juvenile. I'm a juvenile. What they gonna do? He done jumped on my mama. Mm -hmm. So... You couldn't just beat him up? You had to shoot him? But I wanted to kill him. That's what oh, I wanted okay, to do. Okay, okay. So I went and my grandmother... I don't know what made her look for that gun. I don't know what made her look for that gun. But... Um, I was going to D.D. Middle School. I was going to D.D. Middle School off of Broadway. And, uh, to do what? No, that's the school I was going to at the time. That's the okay. school I was enrolled but, in. Were you backing up? Because I thought you got out no, of No, no, no. This was, this was, this was, this was um, before I went to Glen Park. So okay. this was, yeah, this was before I went to, uh, went to Glen Park. Okay. Yeah, before I went to TYC. I was going to D.D. Middle School. And um, my grand this is how I ended up living with my grandmother. So she, uh, she, I don't know what made her look for that gun, but she had dropped me off at my mother's and she went and realized her gun was missing. Mm -hmm. And she came back. Mm -hmm. And she, she didn't say nothing. She was like, well now Darlene, um, I'm gonna take Ramon with me. Mm -hmm. And she's like, well mama, he gotta go to school tomorrow. She said, I'm gonna take him to school. I need him to come do something for me at the house. Yada, 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 you know what I'm saying? She made up something. I don't even remember what it was. But she was like, I need him to do something for me at the house. I'll take him to school in the morning. So we got in the car, and she said, where is that gun? And I was like, what? She said, where is that gun? She knew. She said, Ramon, you know, we had a long conversation. And she said, don't let your mother be the death of you, nor let her get you sent to prison. She said, Darlene is making her own decisions. She, you know, she want to be with him. That's what she want to do. She said, don't let that, don't let that, you know, ruin your life. So um, 
Of course, it was an emotional moment. And she was like, just get your stuff and come live with me. So that's how I ended up living with my grandmother. Um, but my, she still couldn't stop you from doing wrong because you ended up at TYC. Yeah, no, I wasn't going to stop. I, I wasn't going to stop because even but though I even was... Even though living, you got out of the volatile situation? Because I, at this point in time, my mother ended up having seven kids. Oh, my God. So at this point in time, she got five kids at the house. Mm. And my brother and I, you know, growing up, my mother used to say, it's just the three musketeers. It's just me, her, and my brother. So even though I'm not in the house, I still see her. Mm -hmm. I still see my sisters. I still go by there. The lights not so up. So all five are girls? Uh, no, three girls, two boys. Okay. So I'm still seeing my, my sisters and my brothers, and they not having, you know, I'm going to grandma's house. The refrigerator loaded. Mm -hmm. They refrigerator empty. They struggle. They in the struggle. They in the struggle. You know what I'm saying? It's lights, water, and gas where I'm at. They hooked up to the neighbor's water hose. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So, of course, that don't sit well with me. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm not going to live in her house because I'm a kidless nigga. Right, right. Okay. You know what I mean? But I can still pay bills. I can still put food in the house. I can still buy shoes and clothes for my sisters and my brothers. I can still look out for my mother because at this point in time, she needs somebody to look out for. Now, was your brother out of boot camp or was he back my with you? My brother and I came home from boot camp on the exact same day. Okay, August 26th. 1992. I didn't know he was getting out and he didn't know I was getting out. They flew me home from West Texas. My grandmother and my mother picked me up at the airport. And uh, my brother, they had went to his graduation from boot camp earlier. Let's stop for a moment and see if we can take a phone call. Caller, you're on. Please ask your question. Thank you. Hi there. I am wondering about some of the conditions of confinement. Uh, for example, you know, our Texas summers are absolutely brutal. And I wonder what that experience was like. Okay, let's talk about that. So let's first talk about TYC, and then you can talk about prison. So TYC is the Texas Youth Commission. What were the uh, what were oh, the man, conditions? Oh man, TYC like? is is outside. Let's talk about the environmental. It's AC. It's like a dorm. Okay. You're like in a dorm. Because you're going to school you're and they're trying to, to treat you like kids. Yeah, okay. they they still treat you. You know, you locked up, but they still treat you like a human. You get paid to work. You know what I'm saying? Even though you're juvenile? Even though you're juvenile. You get paid. Well, it was at that time, I don't know what they're doing now, but then it was 50 cents an hour to work. You know, you didn't work for free. You had to work. You had to go to school. So that's that's how our days was. We had to work, and then after work, I mean, after school, we had different jobs. You might work in the kitchen. You might work. Once I got my GED, I worked in maintenance because I didn't have to go to school. But those kids or the students that were still school age or still had to go to school, everybody had a job. You went to school, you got paid to do your chores, you got paid to work, you know, it might only be a couple hours, but you got paid something, right? right? AC, air conditioning, I mean... It was a dorm. It was a dorm. Prison? All right. What was prison like? So... Because I always hear that prison, there's no A.C. in the rooms, like the dormitory part. It's just the A.C. is in the common areas. So what do you say about that? That is a lie. Okay. So what was your experience? So you got two, in, in Texas, you got mainly two different styles of prisons. You got the Michael prototype units, and you got what they call red bricks. The red bricks are the old, old, old units, right? They still got bars. And then the Michael prototype units, the cells are bigger. You don't have bars. None of them have air conditioning, all right? The only, um, not the common areas, not the day rooms, not the cell blocks. Just the school and the Just uh, the school and the, the church. Church. The school, church, church, and then and the infirmary. visitation. And what about visitation? Yeah, vi visitation. Huh? Yeah. Visitation, visitation. So school, medical. church, medical, and visitation. Right. The library, the law library, and the library. Yeah, because that's all in the schoolhouse. So yeah, everything yeah, yeah. that's in the school, uh -huh. everything that's in the schoolhouse, in the chapel, the library, the law library, that's all inside the schoolhouse. <clears throat> visitation is in the control main building where the warden and all that stuff is. So that's air conditioned. But where y'all live and work out and eat and all that is no AC. No. But people always say that. They always say that. Colin, you got any other questions about the conditions? Yeah, how did how did you stay, stay cool? And did you ever see anybody pass out or die from the heat? 
So one of the things about prison is that um, what from our under, my understanding is they don't hardly ever produce pronounce anybody dead in prison. No, they take you, they send you to the hospital. They're gonna send you to the hospital. They're gonna they send gonna you to the hospital. They're gonna be doing life saving measures. I don't care if you got a, a, a knife in your head. They're gonna be doing life saving measures. You're not gonna die in Texas prison. And even if you do, it, you, it's not gonna be reported that you do. Not They're gonna you. take you to the hospital. That happens at the Harris County Jail. So too. they manipulate the numbers so it doesn't seem that exactly. the public can be aware of their deaths from heat related incidents. Indeed. Right. So, and then like to stay cool, man, you can't take off enough clothes. Right. You know what I mean? So you get, you. Uh, what I would do is just, and the, the brothers that's listening, the bunks is metal. So you take your mat off, you put a wet towel on the bunk, you lay on the towel, and you take another wet towel, and you lay it on your body. The chest. You know what I'm saying? Put some around your neck, and you be very, very still. Mm. <laughs> you be very, very still. And every couple of hours, you got to, we wet that tile because it, yes. it, it, it's, it's, it's gonna dry. It's, up. it's gonna dry. Up. Yeah, and you be very, very still. Oh my goodness, that's horrible. I never, I never want to do that, ma'am. You got anything else you want to ask about? Um, Thank no, I think that that answers my question, and I just can't imagine being in that that situation in the heat and no escape. Um, so thank you for for you know, bringing awareness to this situation and let us know what's really going on behind those walls. I'm glad you asked that question. People are always saying, boy, they got, you know, they got AC, they got free this and free cable that. And and cable and all that's not true. All that's a lie. That's a lie. Oh, they that's a lie. They treat you less than human in prison. Thank you for calling. Um, so talk about that. So I want you to get back to, how'd you get to prison though? So after you get back to TYC, you acting bad again, even though you're smart and you got your GED. So tell I, me, tell me what sends you what back. Happened? So you said that was before drugs. Now are we still before drugs? Or no, this is after, after drugs. drugs. So my mom started using drugs so in 84, you did 85. I used to smoke weed. I have never used hard drugs. Okay. I've never used hard drugs. So you drank and did weed? I, yeah, I drank beer and I smoked weed. Okay. That was my, that's my thing. You I never did never, crack? I ain't never did crack, never popped no pills, I ain't shoot no dope, snort no dope, none of that. That's just, yeah. that's, no. I smoked weed, I drank me some beer. Okay. Right? Is um, there another call holding or is that just, uh, just a, a note? If there's another call, okay, cool, thank you. Um, so I come home from state school, I'm out, I'm, um, I got a couple of jobs. I, you know, I'm 16 years old, I worked at Astroworld, I worked at the hospital, I worked at Continental Coffee, and then I started robbing again. Mm, 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 and got caught. And got caught. So I... Um, so how much time did they give you? They gave me 15 years. I, now was that a trial or a plea bargain? No, that was a trial. I went, I was... Well, why did you go to trial? You knew you did it. Because they offered me 30 years on okay. the plea bargain. Okay, so you and just I wanted to beat that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, oh, shit, if they're going to give me 30 yeah. years, they're going to have to get that to me. Was it non-ag? Well, it was no affirmative finding. It was a robbery case. Uh, they charged me with aggravated robbery, but there was no affirmative finding. They never found a gun. They never could prove that there was a weapon. So I got the 15 years with a non, no affirmative finding. So no non-ag. Right. Well, they still made you stay the whole they, time, oh yeah, though. They, they can treat it, because, yeah. see, Could they keep it's, that it's still a... What year was that? This, I got arrested July 11, 1994. They that's still why, No, 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 let, let, me tell you, let me tell you why it is. It was, it was the year he went. So in 94, that's mm -hmm. when they just done those state jails. So when, if, you, if you went in that early time in the 90s when they created state jails, they didn't always have state jails, then they had a place for people to go for those non... Most felonies are nonviolent, were nonviolent. And the violent, the nonviolent and the violent men mixed up was making the prison system explode. It was too many people there. So they had to hurry up and parole you out to make space for the next groups that were coming in. Right. But once they created state jails, and I can't remember what year it was, it was either 92, 93, or 94, whenever they created it, all these not forgeries, dope cases, you know, no guns, no access, that was the majority of the cases. Those people went to state jail, and you could go for up to two years, from six, 180 days to yeah. six months, I mean, to two years. When all of those cases came out of the prison system. It opened the doors. It was a whole bunch of space now. To it was keep a whole bunch longer. of space. So everybody who went around that time, they did all their time. Because it took about 10, 15 years to fill the jails back up, to fill the prisons back up with aggravated, Case. violent of cases. And so that's, he got caught in that. If you went like 
in 2000 or something like that, people were kind of paroling out a little bit faster. But back then, he went exactly when all that space was opened up. And I, and people were like, oh man, you should you was down that mess. It, it was up. the time. I seen parole eight times in 15 years. Every time I was eligible for C parole, I saw them. I did not have a messed up disciplinary. Wow. A lot of people think, oh man, you had to be done. Did a lot of people that went with you, uh, did they stay a long time too like you? Everybody. It was, it was all the, it was, so that's why, it was, that's another frustrating thing I used to get. Well, how long is he gonna stay? You gonna stay as long as the jails have space? Unless it's aggravated, then we know you're gonna come up for parole halftime. You're gonna come up for parole. That doesn't mean you're gonna get out. No. So, but when they went during that time, it's just a known fact. They had a lot of space. So it was all about space. It's not, and so that's another frustrating thing when people, mamas call me and say, well, this one did this kind of time. It's all about the space of the whole TDC system. And that, that time they had created, so everybody, that was an unlucky time to go because you had to do your time. Everybody I, I did, did every, their time. I did every day. And like I said, I seen parole. I did have, I wasn't no role model inmate. I had some problems. I had some fights. But it's not what people think that, oh, man, Ramon down there tripping. No, I saw parole eight times. Wow. I saw parole eight times in 15 years. So I was eligible each, each time. I was eligible each time. And they would set me off, said, nature of the offense, nature of the offense. So what, when did you get out of prison? I got out of prison April the 30th, 2010. And you went in in 94? I went in July the 11th, 1994. So what did you do to keep from going back to prison? That's the major, that's the million dollar question. So that's what, I got Because you spent a lot of, you spent most of your years in prison at this point. Right. So I have a thing that I like, it's chaos into purpose. So I just had to find, it's a bunch of things happened. Okay, let me say that. It was a lot of things that happened. First thing that happened was I really understood or believed that I was worth more than being in prison. That was the very first thing is that I found myself at the Telford unit in SEG, and they was throwing feces on each other and all mm -hmm. kind of stuff, man. And I remember I woke up in that cell and I said, I know God didn't create me for this. So Ain't were they no going, way. you think they were throwing feces because they were going crazy or what? I mean, why are people acting, why are they what, doing foolish stuff so like that? So let me say, one thing that they don't really do is a lot of that is mental health not being diagnosed and treated. Right. And then and it's been aggravated by segregating you. Right. So instead of treating what's going on with persons, they just separate the behavior. Once you stop being your your behavior become antisocial in population, or if you violent or gang related, you really have to be really really bad to go to seg. Like you got to push the envelope to be seg. Uh oh. Uh oh. Like, they don't seg people in prison. Unless prison ain't, it's just not good. It's like, you can't even keep you in prison. Okay, may I use that as a segue to ask Ramon why he went to say <laughs> <laughs> It is crazy he said it because uh, my ex-wife, Nicole, she wrote me a letter when I was in prison, when I went to say You called a wife in between going back? No, no. Okay. She was, I, we got married when I came home. Okay. So, but she, I knew her. She was right. my high school girlfriend. Gotcha, gotcha. And so she wrote me and she said, it's a shame that they, you locked up and they had to lock you up. You locked up in lockup. You couldn't behave out here in the streets and you can't act right in there. They had to lock you up in there. She said, that's a shame because you too smart for that. And I still had that letter. And that was one of the letters that spurred some change in me. And at the time, it was just the right time I was reading As a Man Thinketh and I was reading, reading Creating Your Own Circumstances. And I was reading this book by Naeem Akbar called The Psychological Transformation of the Human Mind. And, and all of those things at the time was like, damn, bro, you think God created you to sit in this prison? But back to why they doing that. Let me show you something. I went to, I went to SIG for assault on a public servant, a guard, okay? And a lot of people were like, my mother, my mother and I had a bad argument about this because she came to see me and she was like, you down here ain't boo. Cause when she came to visit me, the warden stopped her before I got to, before she got to visit. 
and told her whatever he told her, Ramon down here doing yada, yada, yada. So she come in there, this 1998, May the 16th, 1998. Boy, you remember them days. She come in there and she say, it's a Saturday. She say, man, woo, 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 woo. And I said, mama, when have you ever known me to start a fight? She's like, what? I say, mama, when have you ever known me to start anything? I'm going to finish it, but just when have you ever known me to start anything? I said, man, that man started that shit, but I'm not going to let him hurt me. Right. You know what I'm saying? I said, I, I promised you I'm not going to let anybody hurt me. Officer, inmate, nobody is going to hurt me. So they put me and said, I beat the hell out of him. I did. I whooped his ass, but he had it coming. They put what did he do to you? I had the audacity to challenge their authority and say, hey, man, we supposed to have more time to eat than this. That's what it all started behind. It was like they rushed. As soon as we sat down to eat, he said, get up, y'all got to go. I said, hey. We just sat down. Man, we just sat down, man. I ain't even had a chance to drink the juice that's in the cup. Man, I said, get out of there. I said, you right. This your world. I say, this your world, man. I say, this this would make you feel good. You know what I'm saying? I say, hey, man, you must not be running shit in the streets because in here, you the big man. And I was walking past him, and he walked behind me and said, what you said? I said, you heard me. And he was like, get up against the wall. And he told me to face the wall. I say, no, nah, I ain't facing the wall, man. Whatever we gonna do, we gonna do it eyeball to eyeball. And he swung at me. And you know, at that point in time in life, I was 22 years old and all I did was work out, box and run. He's, he was in trouble, mm. okay? So uh, that's what happened with that, you know? And when you see that in prison, this worse than seeing crime on the street. When you see an inmate fight an officer, you start praying for the inmate because you say, you know, oh, Lord, Lord, what did he do? They're going to kill him. They're going to kill him. They're going to kill him. We're not going to see him for about three, four months. They're going to hide. They're going to beat him down, and hide, hide him. him. And when we see him again, we're going to say, man, what happened? Man, they beat, they beat me down. They got, they got down. So is that what happened? No, I've been blessed. Research it. Telfer unit was called terrible, ter ter terrible Telfer that's in at my, the time. That's in my hometown. Texas County. Shout Te out to Texas County, Texas. Telford unit was called Terrible Telford at the time. They had just killed a dude, beat a, a Muslim brother, handcuffed on 8th building. So it was a violent situation. I was tense, scared. But, man, let me tell you something. I whooped his ass. Mm -hmm. And Major Melvin, black dude, he came... It was it was it was it was a bad situation, but what he what they did was they sent three black women in there to stop me, Miss Calhoun, Miss Rusk, and, and they were guards. Uh, they were guards, and Miss Miss Calhoun, Miss Rusk, and this other lady, Miss Cardwell, they came in there, and uh, I thought Miss Rusk was pretty anyway. She was like, Curry, please just calm down. And Ms. Caldwell, she said, Curry, the camera is running. I promise you, it's running. Nobody is going, because I wasn't finna let him handcuff me. Oh, okay. You was about to, it was Man, about to fight to the death down. then. Oh, finna bring the, not finna bring the goon squad. Yeah, yeah okay. they bring, and, but when they came, I had already, so <laughs> I had already dismantled Officer Brown and, saw, and the sergeant. I had already dismantled both of them. And uh, Officer Rice was 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 being dismantled as well, and and Miss Caldwell, Miss Rusnam came in there and she was like, "Curry, please just stop." She said, "They're going to hurt you. Please stop." And I backed up, and she was like, "The camera's running." She had the camera going. She said, "The red light on. It's running. Just just stop." I said, okay. I said, I ain't putting on no handcuffs. She said, let's just walk to the 11 building. She said, just walk to the 11. That's the SEG building. building? Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, solitary. solitary. 12 building is SEG, but 11 building is intake. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So she was like, we just gonna walk to the 11 building. Nobody gonna do nothing to you. Just, let's just go. And so that's how, that's how I got out of that How situation. long did you stay in solitary? I stayed in SIG two years. I oh my God. SIG, I came out of SIG. I knew, I, why didn't you lose your mind in SIG for two years? That's a long time. My, my family say I did. Oh, you did lose your mind. <laughs> okay, my people you say, no, so but, you got out and find, found it, okay. So back to so the back SIG. So back when they in there, they throwing they, feces on this each other. This is why. Let me show you something. When I went to SIG, they took all of my property. When you go to SIG, when you go to administrative segregation, you're on level three. They took all of my property, mm. everything. The only thing that you're able to have is a book, a Bible or a Quran, writing material, five stamped envelopes, and that's it. Mm. No deodorant, mm. no toothpaste. Mm. No soap, mm. no hygiene products at all. at all. Wow. They bring you a sponge little thing on a popsicle stick to brush your teeth in a little, you know, them little water cups that look like a cone. Mm -hmm. It's got some baking soda mm. and stuff. So you can in swish it. that around. Oh, that's you can they, dip it in there. Yeah, that's what they give you to brush your teeth. They give you no deodorant. So you're going to be one round funky. The officers are supposed to come and take you to the shower if they feel like it. Mm. So how many, and I'm back there for fighting the officers, so how right. many showers do you think I got? Right. Right? Right. They treat them like animals. Wow. Right? They treat us like animals. They'll bring, open the bean slot and throw your tray in the, the bean slot is when they open the door, boom. Uh -huh. And all the food flying everywhere. And they'll take your, your food and just throw it, it'll hit the flow. And, and you got a person in there like that, and you come by, you, you may give them their meal, you may not give them the meal, you may let them take a shower, you may not let them take a shower, you may <clears throat> feed them, you may not feed them. Dang. You know what I'm saying? You talk crazy to them, and they get so angry, and right. they can't get to you. Right. I ain't gonna never get that mad. Oh, that's why they start throwing feces. But I then see. When, now when you come to that door or whatever. They might throw something at you. They'll okay. throw something at you. They throw some piss on you, some feces on you or whatever. And I was like, man, I'm too civilized for this. Mm -hmm. So that was, I came home from SEG in 2000, but it still took me, I mean, I came, I got out of SEG in 2000, but it still took me 10 years to get out. Dang. It still took me 10 more years. Let me tell you. But that assault on that, uh, on that officer definitely affected your parole. Yeah. I mean, they ended uh, up dismissing the case, but it was on me for still, a long time. Yeah, it's still I had that on case me. for a long, long time. And then Bowie County, um, they end up dismissing the case, right? They just, they just dismissed the case. And that's how, you know, eventually I ended up coming home. Dang. But Dang, you have good. had a lot of guests. Very few guests that you've interviewed over the years make it to the level of, uh, I, I said, I'm just telling you, it's, it's, a, it's almost, it's really not for the violent, it's, and it's not any shade right. on you. It's like when you totally have disconnected to, to, to. But that's what they had to do to him since they didn't kill him. Now, all the assaults on peace officers... You go into solitary. You, you go into SIG, but when, the, when you go there for that, you didn't realize how animalistic and, and crazy it is. the other people are down there. Not They've everybody been there a long there. time, right? Right, because they, a lot of them got mental health problems, and, and that's, that's how they And that's what made them act them. out in the, in the first place. That's right. what made them act out, because they were mental anyway. And so, that's instead of them trying we to deal with it... We ran out of time, it, and we didn't even get to his... The, 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 get to his... Uh, his mission in life, all the good stuff he's doing. So, yeah, so I got to ask you, Ramon, would you at least, I mean, you can get there, yeah. but uh, can you come back and tell us sure, more? Sure, this is what I, so this okay, is yeah, what Okay, yeah, we got it, because we don't have much time. So this tell us what you do passion. now, though. Tell them this what you do now. This is my passion. So I wrote a book called Chaos into Purpose, and it's about a trans, it's a systematic approach to transformation. And so my passion now is to help other people that's from my demographic kids, you know what I'm saying? And I know a lot of times all these counselors, 
everybody. Oh, just stop doing this and do this and do that and do this. If you take something away, you have to replace it with something. So these kids are hustling. They're doing different things because they have real life trauma adult adult problems problems yeah. right and they don't have the skills to solve it exactly so they, they the need skills. mental health i'm a very i'm an advocate of mental health treatment mental health treatment and let me just say this because i want you to come back i this is what i've learned and you know this danny i've been getting people's stories since 2011 and the one thing that i see that's missing is the mental health piece the people who've successfully done what you've done have all gotten mental health treatment i mean yeah. that it's the mental it's the self help realizing i need to get some help and i need to be able to deal with my anger because it's, it's you're angry angry you're angry you're angry when you, to get you in there and you're angry when you get out and so you got to deal with that angry so you don't have that effort moment and go back and, and so one of the things that I've learned dealing with uh, Damien and the Cognitive Justice uh, Initiative is this, is that we ascribe every emotion to anger. Right. Right? Every emotion. And that was another thing that I learned. I'm not angry. I'm hurt. Mm -hmm. I'm disappointed. Mm -hmm. I'm frustrated. These are all emotions that in, in our demographic we don't get a chance to explore. We don't get a chance in that lower demographic, and even in prison, you don't get a chance to explore my feelings of hurt. My mother died while I was in prison. I didn't even get the chance to grieve or mourn that. One of the things that uh, the psychologist pointed out to me, that the basis of anger or oftentimes is fear. Right. And so they, they got involved in, okay, what do you mean? I'm not scared. How does anger and fear how do they have anything to do with each other? Well, that fear, for whatever reason, anger is your way to deal with it. To deal fight with the fear. It's fight or flight. Oftentimes. Right, it's right. fight or flight. Right, right, right. I mean, I've had a lot of, I ain't never been hit first. <laughs> I ain't never been hit first. I thought you, I thought you, you they, they started it and you finished it. No, I ain't never been hit first. So when they Because if we're arguing you. and you come in striking distance, I'm going to hit you. Okay. I'm not going to move. I'm not going to. If Danny and I start arguing, I'm going to be right here. If he come right here, I'm going to hit him because okay. I'm scared. I ain't going to let him hit me first. Okay. Well, we, we've been told to wrap up. Okay. So all I can do is see if you'll come back in two weeks and finish this story. Yeah, man, and you know I'll what we back. need to start back? Well, we're hurt. We're angry. Our mother died. You know, I, I, my mother died when I was young, too, so I can relate to that. I just turned mine a different way. Right. So I went the wrong path for a minute, about a year. And then, uh, but I, I, I caught it when I was young. So I'm just saying part of my mission in doing what I do is because I watched a lot of people in my situation and similar just go wrong. And by the grace of God, some, some epiphany, I, I dealt with it like this. My mother, you know how Jesus Christ died so we could live? I had to finally satisfy my young brain that my mother died so I could live. That's, yeah, yeah. And then you when I did that, I had to yourself. have a purpose bigger than me and know she was watching me and I'm going to make her proud of me. So I, I definitely want to come back. So we'll, we need to talk about that. Thank you for watching. We've we got to wrap this up right now. Danny, just try to say what you do right quick. Uh, Path of Freedom, St. John's, 2018, uh, 2019 Crawford Street, every Thursday, 537. Uh, so nonprofit, a faith-based organization aimed at reducing recidivism, support group. At St. John's United Methodist Church, 2019 Crawford, every Thursday at 6.30. Danny leads a group of people formerly incarcerated. You can send anybody there. We're going to talk to you and try to work you through this situation because we do not want you to go back to prison. Thank you for watching Truth and Justice with Vivian King. Good night. Thank you for tuning in again. Tonight we have something really good, a hot topic in the news this week. But he's been charged with crime. This is a show where...